This What's Working with Cam Marston podcast is brought to you courtesy of Michelob Ultra Beer. They say consistency is the key to success. They weren't wrong. So how about grabbing a beer that's consistently smooth, consistently refreshing, and consistently light? You might just find that the road to success can be pretty enjoyable. Michelob Ultra, the perfect balance of taste and refreshment and only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. Enjoy responsibly. Anheuser-Busch Michelob Ultra Light Beer, St. Louis, Missouri. Welcome, everyone, to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is the show designed to bring you insights on workplace, workforce, and marketplace trends. I want the trends shaping the workplace, the workforce, and the marketplace around you to be the focus of the show so that you can understand what they are and apply these learnings or these insights or whatever it may be to your own business. The goal, let's get you just a little bit better at whatever it is that you do. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, all housed at the University of Alabama. I thank them greatly for their sponsorship. Lots going on on this show today. We're straying into, not straying, we're walking. We're deliberately, purposefully moving into an area that we've not discussed on the show before. And uh, I'll tell you about that in just a moment. Before that, My goodness, how many times have I mentioned my forthcoming book? I'm happy to say, as I sit down to record this show, that the books are on a UPS truck to be delivered to my office this week, my first load of them to be delivered. The book is out there, and now that it's out there, I'm working on ways to get it available to the public, available to sell, and that takes some website work, which is not something I know anything about, and I'm going to my website people to get them to help me out. But one of the things that I did in developing the book was make sure each chapter came to me as a PDF document that I could share. And as a result of the celebration of the arrival of the book, I'm going to give away chapter one if anybody's interested. So here's what it is. Chapter one is called Pursue Your Passion. And the, well, let's go back to the book itself. The book is called What Works? The 10 Best Ideas from the First 200 Episodes. Not the 10 best episodes, the 10 best ideas. And one of those ideas that clearly came through was to pursue your passion. And I've heard that more recently for some reason than ever before. When you're pursuing your passion, it never feels like work. Chapter one goes into how to do this how to find your passion, how to realize it when you've found it. And I feature interviews with, number one, Lane Zerlot with Murder Point Oysters. Lane is one of the most charismatic people I've ever had on the show. You will be a fan of his as soon as you hear his interview. But Lane talks about how he learned about the oyster business and how once he learned about it, he never returned to shrimping and he had found his passion. Second interview featured in chapter one is with Jeff Ziders about uh, his company, CigarClub.com, and how he created that. And it wasn't only about cigars. It was about exposing people to these small batch cigars. Now, I am a subscriber to CigarClub.com and have been for years now. And I can tell you, his passion comes through each time these boxes are delivered on a monthly basis. Third one, Moondance Adventures. They're not based in Mobile. They're based in Nashville. But this guy, Hayes Hitchens, and how he created Moondance. I'm looking through the chapter now. Stephen Cope. I've been in touch with Stephen recently. He wrote a book called Discovering the Great Work of Your Life, which is about finding the passion. So if you want a copy of chapter one, email me, cam, C-A-M, at cammarston.com. All you have to do is put chapter one in the subject line, and I'll send it to you. So again, email cam, C-A-M, at cammarston.com, chapter one in the subject line, and I will attach chapter one and send it to you. And when the book is available for purchase through the website, I will let you know. Now, let's move into the content of the show today. Eunice Mingo is my guest. I was introduced to her not long ago from a mutual friend. Here's what we need to know. There is an extraordinary amount of violence in our society right now. And it seems to have reached a crescendo. And I started mining my network to say, who knows a therapist out there that may see the world differently than I do, who may can put something new in front of me 
uh, based on the way I see the world. I was introduced to Eunice. She is a African-American licensed professional counselor. So her profession is in counseling. But when I learned that she was African-American, I thought, I think, and a female, maybe she can teach me something about the violence or about the world that I see. I need a new point of view. I need to understand this differently. So she and I get into a couple of things upcoming. So we recorded this already. Here's what you're going to hear. She's going to teach you and me how to spot the people in our surroundings, whether it's our workplace, our neighbors, our children, our children's friends, who may be on the edge of doing something extreme. The, the, the profile of the people that are committing the violence are young males, let's say youngish males. And there may be more to it. We'll talk to her about it. But... Uh, how do we spot these people and what do we do not to rescue the people in times of violence in the actual action, but to prevent it from ever getting to that point? What can you and I do? And she and I will talk about that. And then in the segment four, just before, uh, you know, segment four in segment four, she talks to me a little bit about Cam. Here's what you as a middle aged white guy. And that's most of you out there. Let's face it. My listener is a 45 year old or older male, um, more than likely white. She says, Cam, here's what you as a middle aged white guy don't see that I see. Here's the world that I see that you probably don't know anything about. And I tell you what, folks, there's a lot. My blissful little world got exposed to some things with my conversation with her, and she rightfully told me what's going on out there. This is a different show than what I normally provide. You're going to learn a lot from this one. Hang in there with me. I'll have her when we come back from break. Prior to break, here's what you need to know about Sander for Wealth Management. And I'm a big fan of this designation called the CFP. And I'll tell you about this right now. Not every financial planner is certified. A CFP, Certified Financial Planner, is someone who's dedicated themselves to the four E's of financial planning, education, examination, experience, and ethics. Both Jamie Sandifer and Mark Salyers are certified financial planners at Sandifer Wealth Management. Check them out at Sandifer Wealth Management. Find them online. Their office address is Old Shell Road here in Mobile. They can work with anyone anywhere in the state if that's of interest to you. Mark and Jamie are CFPs. Don't let any other person that does not have a CFP touch your money. That's the way I feel about it. And that's proven to be true for me. When we come back, Eunice and I will be talking about violence in our society right now and what you and I can get do to get involved with it. You're listening to What's Working, brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business at the University of Alabama. My family, Turn to the Experts is more than a tagline. It's a promise. Every Keith technician is an experienced AC professional, and that saves you money. Speaking of money, how about 0% financing for up to 60 months on installations of new carrier systems? Keith and Carrier, Turn to the Experts. Mobile's leading name and comfort since 1964. License number 83731. We're back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business at the University of Alabama. As I said in the opening segment, we're taking a different tack today, folks. This is a conversation that needs to happen. I'm sitting in the studio this afternoon, or this morning rather, with Eunice Mingo. Eunice is a national board certified counselor, as well as a board certified master addictions counselor. She received a Bachelor of Science degree in criminal justice from the Alabama State University and a Master of Science degree in community mental health counseling from the University of South Alabama. Eunice has also completed postgraduate courses at the University of Mobile in marriage and family counseling and counseling studies at Mississippi College. Eunice, thank you so much for your time. Welcome to What's Working. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to be here. I am elated. Well, I'm glad that you're elated. We're going to wade into some sensitive and vulnerable topics here that I truly feel need to happen in our community today. As you and I talked about prior to the recording began, I feel like the world is on fire right now. And part of the goal of this conversation is to help my listeners understand a different point of view and just as importantly, 
what they can do about the world on fire right now. We can't give up. We've got to engage. And perhaps we can get into that. But first, let's talk about the violence in our society right now. It's both local as well as national. What is your interpretation of this violence? What do you think is going on out there, Eunice? I think it's escalating. Everything is happening at one time and everything is so intense. Um, It is impacting every part of everybody's lives. And I think a lot of what's going on is so there's a lot of social media, a lot of um, information that wasn't really readily available in this way or obtainable in this way um, as it was in the past. And now everybody has so many influences. And so if someone has that one seed of something that's that society deems is not right and it's morally not right, then after that one seed is planted, there's a whole lot of water that can go into there to cause that seed to grow. And so one of the things that I that comes to me is the um, the hatred, just the overt and covert, too, um, hatred against certain people and certain types of people in certain communities. Where does that come from? Where does that hatred come from? A lot of it is uh, maybe from the family, but a lot of times it comes from just the exposure, the social media, the groups that people are in, um, the radical groups that people are in, the persuasion of the news, just a whole lot of things. Just because you only what grows is what you feed. So if you're feeding and your interest is in a certain is in a particular thing, you're going to feed that and you're going to continue to feed that. And if you get negative input, your output is going to be negative. So you're being bombarded with that. What is the profile of the people committing this violence? How much do we know about them? Is there a a fingerprint of who they are? So we've got shootings going on in Mobile. We've got shootings going on across the nation. Is there a way to kind of corral these shooters and that they have things in common? Yeah, there are several profiles um, because there are, of course, different types of shooters. Profiles, um, one of the things I know that we look for in counseling, um, there's not always a mental illness but there can be mental health. And I think a lot of times people can confuse mental illness with um, poor mental health. A lot of times people are not exposed to things that they need to cultivate uh, a proper way of thinking or a proper way of conflict resolution or a proper way of solving things or even a proper way of living with people that you just don't necessarily jail with. Um, now the way things are, I guess, right in our face, it's like, let's take care of the problem. That The problem is always perceived as a threat when it's really not always a threat. So these people that I, I love the distinction between mental health issues versus what, 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 did, what did you say? Men- mental health versus mental illness. Mental health versus mental illness. There may be people out there with mental health issues, not diagnosable mental, mental illnesses. Correct. And uh, they are choosing to feed on these, on the things that are making their mental health issue worse. And it's leading to an action. What is the point where someone goes from feeding on this stuff to taking an aggressive action towards someone else? Is there a trigger that pushes them over the edge? Sometimes there can be, but we have to take into consideration who they are listening to. So the people that they may be listening to are the all types of people. Some of them may fall into the category of um, having a mental illness. And one particular that I think about is what we call antisocial or pers- personality disorder. Um, a lot of people confuse that with being antisocial because it looks the same on paper. But that's usually the disorder that your serial killer would have. Um, someone that really doesn't relate to others and just, you know, uh, have, has a lot of hatred. But at the same time, they can be seen as loving in one, se- one section of their lives, but they really have like this hatred toward people and their goal is to destroy whatever that is. And so if you have someone, um, especially uh, a teenager or a child that's listening at that and they're very impressionable, um, they can be persuaded to do a lot of things because that's all that they're listening to. They're vulnerable at that age. They're very vulnerable and they're, they can be what they perceive as loyal 
to whatever that cause is. So if that cause is to, let's say, kill black people, then they're going to be loyal to that cause. Even if the person that's persuading them to be that way hadn't done anything, you know, the only thing that they're guilty of is having influence. And influence is a strong thing. But, you know, influence to carry out these acts. Why is it males? Why don't we see female? Thank goodness we don't. But why don't we see females taking these actions? Yeah. And that's a really, really good question. And I don't know that I have the answer for that. Um, but a lot of uh, males, young, impressionable males, um, they feel like it's like a leadership, you know, a leadership role that they're taking care of something that needs to be handled. So um, I don't I'm not sure why there are a lot of females doing that. Kind of the man of the house. He's going to take care of the problem. Right. And, absolutely. And step up and do that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned social media is one of the things, one of the seed, let's say the water that's feeding the seed out there. And there's so many veins of social media. What else is out there feeding the seed? Has there been I'm, I'm curious if the. Our, our past three to four unprecedented years and then the, uh, the the inflation as you and I talk right now. Are there other things that you can point to that are feeding this behavior? Um, I can say so. Social media is a big influence. And now people are able to be more openly racist or openly uh, display their hatred toward people and other people pick up on it. So there are, besides social media, there are like physical gather gatherings that people are really getting together because you have an extreme portion of people who don't believe in the social media or any kind of technology. So they are coming together some type of way. Um, so that there's an influence there. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I, I, Social media, we point to social media for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get the headlines usually off of social media, and then I'll choose whether to dig in or not. I was unaware that the, um, well, I guess I kind of knew it, but the extremist groups, the hate groups, the ones that are feeding that thing also have a dominant presence on social media. When you work with your patients, do you call them patients or clients? Clients. Me, clients. When you work with your clients, is that one of the questions you ask them is how much time did the, are you spending on that? Yes, that question has become uh, a part of our assessment piece because we want to know how much time is spent in front of the computer, how much time is spent, is spent um, gaming, um, because all of that influences the way you think. Um, and you do, you're using different parts of the brain, and there are different parts of the brain that you're not using that you should be using. So mm -hmm. how you process things are greatly considered by how much time you spend in front of the computer and what you're consuming. You talked about antisocial. There is the serial killer who is an antisocial individual. And when I hear antisocial, I think of somebody that doesn't like to go out on the weekends and wants to spend their Friday nights at um, home in front of the TV with maybe family or close friends. Yeah. Well, that's not what we're talking about, is it? The antisocial talking you're talking about is one that wants to take action against different people, correct? Yes, yes for whatever bias they have. Um, against people, whatever gratification they feel like they, they need to gain from that. And so um, antisocial used to be referred to, when you hear people say psychopath, you know, that's usually, that falls within that. Yeah. yeah. And the same antisocial person could be in the workforce of any one of the listeners out there, could be a colleague of any one of the listeners out there, and seem to be, from what I understood you say, one of the most caring and loving individuals. But there's a dark, hidden side to them that is escalating, correct? Yes. Um, if you think about uh, people like Ted Bundy... Um, not to be confused with Al Bundy. But right, right, right. <laughs> and I always have to be careful that I didn't say Al because right. that was like one of my favorite shows. But um, Ted Bundy, when people described him, they described him as a family man. And, you know, his children, his family members didn't really, you know, see that part of him, of course, because they didn't need to see that part of them. That wasn't the part of him that he wanted them to see. But then he had this extremely dark side where, you know, he killed people, Yeah, you know, and a part of him enjoyed doing that. Yeah. So it's like two things can exist at the same time um, when you're dealing with these types of personality. When we come back from break, I want to talk about how we can try to identify these people who are around us. And of course, the goal is to prevent them from triggering and going on to some sort of rampage. 
and I think that's you know, we should all want that. But perhaps there's a conversation to be had of how we can prevent these people from even descending into that dark side. Is there something that you or I or any one of the listeners can do when they say, hey, that sounds like my colleague so and so. And before they get too far down this hole, is there something that I can do to help them out? Because as you and I talked about before the microphones come on, we got to engage this. It's gotten to a crisis point that mm -hmm. you and I, we're not longer on the sidelines. This is in our hands and we need to do something about it. Sound right. good? Well, yeah, we are actually in the game, not on the sidelines. We are in the game. Each one of us folks are in the game. And uh, if we want to change the headlines we see, then let's step up. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Kim Marston. We'll be back after this break. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate at the University of Alabama. They say consistency is the key to success. They weren't wrong. So how about grabbing a beer that's consistently smooth, consistently refreshing, and consistently light? You might just find that the road to success can be pretty enjoyable. Michelob Ultra, the perfect balance of taste and refreshment and only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. Enjoy responsibly. Anheuser-Busch Michelob Ultra Light Beer, St. Louis, Missouri. back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. I'm in the studio today with Eunice Mingo. Eunice is a national board certified counselor, as well as a board certified master addictions counselor. She has a long list of accolades that come after that. I'll save those for later, perhaps. Eunice and I are talking about the extraordinary escalation of violence in our society today and what you and I can do to, to try to eliminate this, to, to get involved. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate at the Culver House College of Business at the University of Alabama. Eunice, prior to the break, what do these antisocial people, look? we talked about their, their behaviors and the fact that they may be among us and we may not have any idea that they have these dark thoughts. Is there not something that they do that could tip us, tip us off that we could say, they're on the verge of going down a dark hole, and when they're down that dark hole too long, they tend to take violent action that impacts the entire community. What can you and I look for in these people to prevent them from going down that dark hole? Well, it's kind of hard to say because, as I said earlier, um, some of them have that side to them where, they're, where they can show characteristics of being a very loving, personable person, you know. But then you have some people that are— um, just have what we call odd behaviors. Um, you may look at, and this is not exclusive to any social personality disorder, just bizarre, what we consider bizarre, clinically bizarre behavior. Um, you know, if you just pay attention to people and their actions and their thoughts about things, because if you engage them in conversation, you get to know a lot of things about people and the way they think. So when you engage them in a conversation and something seems a little off, now that's not to police them, um, like because you may you may have a bias and you start to say, okay, I believe that person is blah blah blah, you know. So let me engage them in conversation. Well, what you are looking for is what you're going to get, even when it's not that. Oh, uh, you're so, look, you have a confirmation bias. Yes. You think there's something fishy about them, and you're going to find something fishy about them. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, and so we have to always be cognizant of that within ourselves. But usually, um, just pay attention to people who are extreme in their behaviors, are extreme in their reactions towards something. It could be extreme anger or it could be extreme um, hopelessness or sorrow, just um, an intense reaction to something. Like if it's sadness, it's a very intense reaction to sadness. Or if it's anger, it's, a, it's like, okay, well, I could see why you were upset, but, you know, to go and punch a hole in the wall at the office, you know, that's a disproportionate reaction to the to the incident or something Absolutely. like that. Yeah. And, and being very proactive about engaging in conversation and saying, hey, you know, let's see if we can get you some help. Yeah. Uh, or making it sometimes making it mandatory helps. Um, I have done several contracts with businesses that um, have said, you know, in order for you to keep working here or in order to, for you to keep your position, we need you to go see uh, this therapist for at least three sessions. Yeah. 
you know, and sometimes three sessions is not enough and sometimes it's just enough. Right. Sometimes I think it needs to be done in six to ten sessions. Right. But, you know, just making those decisions, having those conversations and being vigilant about um, and being educated on uh, the behaviors that extremists have. Right. You know, like some some people may just out of the blue when things are going on, shave their heads. You know, uh, there are a lot of peculiar behaviors, and I'm just calling it peculiar, yeah. that may stand out that you may say, okay, that matches up with the conversation that I had with him or with her. You know, hmm, let me let me call them in. So is there something, let's, let's assume I found somebody in my own workplace and their reaction to bad news was extraordinarily perverse to the, the nature of the news. They overreacted in my appearance to the news. I could go to them and say, hey, your reaction was crazy. Or I could say, for you to continue to work here, you're going to have to go seek counseling because that your reaction somewhat alarmed me. Is there something else? Is there a, a compassion component to this? Yeah, and I think it's important, especially for leaders to be educated on how to deal with things like that. Because while what you said and the way you said it was factual, you know, as a counselor, the approach would, that I would have taken is, hey, it seems like your uh, reaction was very intense. You you want to tell me a little bit about that? Because, you know, I, we may need to evaluate whether or not you need to get more support. Right. So you've approached it a more delicate way. Yeah. You're, you're, you've approached it with outside influences. You need more support, not there's something wrong with you. Right. Because sometimes people bring, you know, like a lot of people say, well, you have to leave home at home and leave work at work. But if you're if you're bringing your brain everywhere you go, <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> there's no way to do that. That. You, could, that you can do that, you know, like over a period of time. So sometimes people have things and, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back, That's right, that sure. is true. So sometimes it may have been a straw that had broken the camel's back and their reaction may be intense, not because of that particular situation. It may be intense because of several situations that happen over a period of time. Right, right. Yeah, so right. we have to be really careful and we have to be careful about um discrimination in the workplace yeah. and things like that, especially when it comes to mental health. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the r r cries that I hear after one of these violent acts has happened, whether it's a local shooting that doesn't make the national news or this thing in, I think it's called Uvalde, Texas, that did make that, is what we need is better parenting. Boy, that sounds nice. Two <laughs> words, better parenting. That'll yeah, solve all the problems. Too. But that's not easy. Yeah. And uh, talk to me about that. What is your reaction when someone says that? Well, yeah. the, the solution is all in better parenting. And, and and we've all seen people with what we consider maybe good parenting or the best parenting, but they still made a decision to do something that they wanted to do. So while I think parenting in certain situations, better parenting in certain situations is necessary, you know, in most situations, it's probably not. But what can the parent do to avoid this situation? Right. You know, um, one of the things that when people say better parenting, I think they need to be really specific um, in engaging with people when they say that, you know, I say, hey, you know, what do you mean by that? So a lot of times uh, pa other parents tell me, um, see what's going on on the child's social media. See what's going on under your roof. Checking the children's phone because a lot of children have a lot of freedom and they do a lot of things because they can. And one of the jobs of a parent is to, you know, um, give choices, rewards and consequences for certain behaviors. And if we don't know what's going on, then we can't evoke proper consequences for certain behaviors that need to be checked. And a lot of parents aren't doing that, but a hell of a, a heck of a lot of parents are. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite all right. A hell of a lot of parents are. And I'm a, I, 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 as a parent of four teenagers, I'm somewhere in the middle, I would guess. There's more yeah. vigilance that I could show, um, but I do show some. And, uh, and, and I'm sure there are parents out there who can relate to that. It's interesting that a, a couple of the things that have uh, that have come up in our short conversation is social media and the phone, which is, of course, the, the channel for so many people mm -hmm. into the social media. Do you view uh, you and I, as we sit here, we have phones on the table. Is this phone uh, uh, the most destructive thing that's been put into our society in our lifetime? Uh, 
it's been very helpful and it has been very destructive, uh, I could say. I think um, any tool can be destructive. Yeah, it's without a good the, point. Yeah, without the right discipline and motive and, you know, uh, because children don't, a lot of children, let's say a 13-year-old doesn't need the same access to a phone that I do. Right. You know, and so I don't think as parents, you know, we're doing a, we're not doing a bad job, but it's like, okay, here's the phone, right. you know, because they need phones. They need to get in touch with us when they're in different places. But we have to look at everything that comes along with having the phone. Right. Like, can they handle that great responsibility? And a lot of times as parents, we don't even really think about it. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly very reflective of my own household. When we, too. <laughs> when we come back from break, I want to talk about the unique perspective between you and me. Okay. You are an African-American female. You are a licensed counselor and hear a lot of this. And I, I don't know who your your clients are, whether they're primarily African-American or not. I am a middle aged, overweight, thinning haired white guy. And I have come to the point in in my living that I'm ready to admit there's a lot out there that I don't know. And you offer perspective that I don't have. And when we come back, I want you to talk to me about what I don't know. And there are, most of my listeners out there are just like me. So I want you to educate us. And this is not content that is typically broadcast on talk radio. And that's why I asked you to be in here. Because I think part of the issue with the violence might be what you know goes on out there, the world you see, which may be very dramatically different from my own. And I'm ready for you to hit me right between the eyes with it. Okay. Sound Sounds like good. a plan? Yes. When we come back, Eunice and I will go deep on this. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Kim Marston. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business at the University of Alabama. It's hotter than hot season, and for three generations, Keith has earned your trust during the hottest time of the year. Every Keith technician is an expert, because when the heat's the worst, you need the best. So turn to the two names you can count on, Keith and Carrier. Mobile's leading name in comfort since 1964. License number 83731. Customer service never goes out of style. In fact, I think it's safe to say that customer service is more valuable and more important now more than ever. Hi, this is Cam Marston. One thing that my over 200 episodes of What's Working has taught me is how important customer service is to building and maintaining a thriving business. It's the growing need for customer service that's led me to partner with one of the state's leading customer service trainers to create our program called Delivering Five Star Customer Service. Your team will get one 90-minute training session per month for six consecutive months. Each session builds on the skills learned the previous month, allowing your customer-facing teams to practice before moving on to the next lesson. And the six lessons address everything from appearance to electronic communications to conflict resolution to maintaining a service mindset. Our program travels and is delivered in person at your workplace, nothing virtual. You simply can't practice the level of the skills this course teaches virtually. For more information, email me, cam at cammarston.com, and let's schedule a time to talk. Remember, you have less to fear from outside competition than you do from discourtesy and bad service from inside your own company. Again, email me, cam at cammarston.com, and let's talk about your business. <laughs> We're back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate housed in the Culver House College of Business at the University of Alabama. I'm in the studio. Eunice Mingo is with me. She's a national board certified counselor as well as a board certified master addictions counselor. An extraordinary amount of content for her. I'll tell you how to find her in the end of this segment if you want. 
Eunice, prior to the break, we were talking about what I don't know. Middle-aged, overweight, thinning-haired white guy. I make fun of me about this, but the world is full of them. And I think the world that I've been brought up in and that I see is much different than the world that you see. And I'm just going to turn it over to you with this question. What, Eunice, do I need to know about your world? And my listeners, what do we need to know about your world? Um, Okay, I could kind of write a book about this uh, because I think... Uh, one of the things that we both have in common, we want to see a solution. But one of the things that I think people need to know is know your biases and know how they affect the people around you. Um, And sometimes it's impossible for us to know our biases because we only know what we know, right? Uh, We only know what we were taught. We only know what we've been around. And sometimes you don't know until somebody brings awareness to it. But what do you do with that with that awareness? You know, what how are you willing to challenge yourself to make a change? Uh, Because we know we have biases against certain things and certain types of people. And I have to check myself all the time. And I have um, what I call coat pullers, people that pull my coattail and say, hey, you know, you need to think about the way you're handling that particular situation or the way you're handling that particular person. You know, then I have to check myself. So one of the things that uh, one of the most important things is just have people around you that will hold you accountable that you will listen to. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the hardest parts uh, is being a sister to a black male and being a mother to a black male, you know, and having relationships with black males. One of the hardest things, especially as a mother, uh, for me to do is like set up a strategy for my son who was at one time really, really clueless because he had an array of friends. You know, like I grew up, I had I went to a black school, had black friends, but my son had an array of friends. Um, and just to say, hey, Marquise, you know, you're you're a black male. So, you know, and you're tall, you know, like you you're really like a big black dude, you know, and beware of, you know, going in the store with your hoodies on. Don't have your hoodie on. If you need to, take it off. You know, um, if you don't go in the store with your hands in your pocket. When you get stopped by the police, you know, just make sure you have your hands out. Just ha- make sure you just comply. And just comply is always a trigger for me because sometimes I am complying and sometimes uh, black men are complying um, and things still happen. So you've had to teach your son. Yeah. Things that as and I'm guessing here that as a parent of a white child. Well, I know I've never told my son when you go into the store, make sure your hands are out of your pocket. I've never told my son when you go into the store, make sure your hoodie is down. These are things that are happening. And I don't like the way I say this, but on your side of the world Mm -hmm. that my side of the world is unaware of. Right. Because if I understand there is a bias against a big black dude. Yeah. And they will view him as aggressive or up to no good. Yeah. Just his presence is perceived in some instances as aggression. And does that sicken you to your stomach to have to say that to your son? Yes, it makes me very, very angry. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah, um, mainly because my son is, he's a really soft-spoken kid, and, you know, he doesn't have a a bark, you know. And so it sickens me to have these talks with him, and he's like, oh, Mom, you're just taking it too seriously or mom it's not that bad and I have to say no it is that bad you know but his view of our world is very different from mine and mine's mine come from a background I'm a criminal justice major I've worked in the criminal justice field you know I've worked in corrections I was married to a police officer so I've seen things I've seen a lot of things not only have I seen things I've heard things to the point where with the shooting and all of that in um, Texas I don't have any notifications on my phone. Somebody had to tell me about that. Mm. And so I had to wait to hear about it. You know, I had to wait wait to read about it because I had to wait till I was mentally ready, you know, to hear about it. So it's like, wow, what's happening? What's going on? Who did it? Why? Because I didn't know the circumstances surrounding it. And I didn't, surrounding that, and I didn't want it to be another crime against a black person or, you know, minority or whatever. So... 
Tell me about what happened in Buffalo. So let, let me tell you, you know the story. There's a, if I recall, it was a white male. He drove from, I think it was Ohio. Yeah. Did a zip code search to find a heavily populated zip code in Buffalo full of African-Americans and went there to shoot African-Americans. How do you feel about that, Eunice? This is not something that a white guy, many of my, my listeners, has ever confronted. How does yeah. this make you feel? How does... What do I need to know about this as the middle-aged white guy? Yeah, so for me, um, I really had an extreme or intense amount of anxiety, especially having to go to the store the next day. I had, I said, well, I go, I have to go to Walmart. Went to Walmart, it was bad. So I went to Publix, it was still bad. It was the fact that the actual store was a trigger, you know. And I'm looking around at different people, saying, okay. Is that okay? He's making a quick movement. You know, I had an intense, and I'm a person that I'm trained in crisis intervention. I'm trained in a whole lot of stuff, and I had this reaction because it's happening to my people. You know, so I'm a target even if I'm going to the grocery store. You're a target even if you're going to the grocery store in a completely different part of the country. Right. Right. So. Uh, um, how did you explain this to your children or do you have any clients that are in that are young and have to explain this to them? Do they come to you and say, why do they do this to us? Yes, I've had to explain it. Um, and it, it was a hard explanation because I didn't have any answers like the same answers that they're seeking. I'm seeking as well. The same fear that they're experiencing. I'm experiencing as well, you know, and for people who. A lot of people say, well, that that's not going to happen here, or I just don't worry about it. But those people didn't plan that happening to them. No. Yeah. And if you are uh, a person that doesn't have to worry about that, and I'm using air quotes, uh, it's a, as we say, it hits different. It hits different. So yeah. I'm a guy that doesn't have to worry about that. Yeah. yeah. And it hits different for me to you. Mm -hmm. What is that difference? Yeah. So um, I think... The fact of knowing that you're not targeted like all the time by several, several different types of people, like it's you know how you have people who hunt deer, you know, and they're they are people who hunt deer, but deer don't have to worry about a whole lot of different people, a whole lot of now I won't say different people, a whole lot of different things hunting them. It's just the people, like we have a whole lot of things hunting us. What else? Um, what else is hunting us? Yeah. Or what else? To, um, we have the uh, people who are just, who people who just hate us. We have police officers who kind of fit that same criteria of people who just hate us. Um, we have people in the workplace, uh, and it's it's really bad in the workplace because it's it looks it's well packaged. That's the word I'm looking for. It's well packaged, and um, it looks professional. It looks. You know, like um, somebody that's going by the book when it's a, a bias that's leading. You know, I've had several different black males that, you know, have been doing like C-suite, having C-suite positions and different things like that and saying they're being targeted and singled out um, in the workplace. And because they have an emotional reaction to it, because after a while, it's only so much that you can take. And so after a while, they have an emotional reaction to it. Oh, he needs anger management. Oh, he needs to um, he needs to be demoted. Oh, he needs some days off, you know, putting them in a position where you can abuse your power to give them the time off because you have a bias is really hard. And it causes a whole lot of stress and anxiety, not only in that black male, but the family that's attached to them. Yeah. Tell me what you think the listener, my listener right now, who's hearing this, what are they thinking? Um, hopefully, I will hope that they're thinking of ways that they can check themselves. I'm hoping they're thinking of ways that they can get some type of uh, training or increase, increase awareness of what they can do um, to make their situation and their knowledge of the whole situation a little bit better, especially if they are supervising or working with minority people. Mm -hmm. If they're working with black people, th they're doing what they need to do. You don't have to be, as we say, extra with it, but just make sure you're using common courtesy. You know, we have a lot of people that have these behaviors and they go to church every Sunday. If they are being godly, if they go by the godly principles that are there, then you don't have anything to work out, worry about. But most of the time, 
you know, some of those principles that they're following are being handpicked. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. the Bible can be used as a recipe book for any hate that you want to develop. It, yeah. it, you just pick and choose what you want out of that thing. Right. It's right. a remarkable document, but mm-hmm. you can, it can be misread just like anything else can be misread. Yes. So I want you to tell me, you, know, you, you, you told me I think your recipe was pretty good, godly principles. If you're giving me advice, if I'm sitting in front of you in your therapy session, we just nearly out of time. Saying, Eunice, how can I be the, uh, how can I be a part of the solution that you and I are talking about here? One of the parts of the solution is helping these people who are about to trigger, who are angry, and that we don't want them to overreact to the point of violence. Another part of the solution is is working well with the black community that surrounds me. And I'm in front of you in the therapy session, and I say, all right, tell me what I need to do to deal with both of these things. What's your advice to me? One of the main things I would say is be genuine, be authentic. You know, if your bias is just your bias, that's just your bias, but be genuine about it, you know, but treat people the way you would want them to treat you. Yeah. And that's the main thing. Um, Be understanding, be open to different viewpoints. You don't have to disagree with it. You don't have to like it. But you don't have to penalize somebody for thinking differently. That's a good point. Yeah. And by bias, let's clarify that term. Bias means what? Pretty much for me, bias means having your way of thinking. Um, And sometimes that some people are not open to any way of thinking, but you have in one way of thinking and that's the way that you go by. Sometimes bias, you know, or unconscious, like we said earlier, until somebody brings that to your attention, then it's like, oh, I am biased towards this group of people or this way of this way of life. Eunice Mingo is with me in the studio. She's a licensed professional counselor. Eunice, do you want to tell people how they can find you if they want to follow up for more information or should I read it off your card here? Um, you can read it off my card. Info, I-N-F-O at EuniceBlakely.com is E-U-N-I-C-E-B-L-A-K-E-L-Y.com. Or better yet, the phone number, 251-250-4161. Or you can email me and I'll put you in touch with her. My email is Cam, C-A-M at CamMarston.com. Eunice, we've touched the tip of a very large iceberg here. And I would yes. hope you'll be willing to come back and explore this deeper at another point. Most definitely. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. You're listening to What's Working. We'll go to break and come back with segment five in a moment. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate at the Culver House College of Business, University of Alabama. They say consistency is the key to success. They weren't wrong. So how about grabbing a beer that's consistently smooth, consistently refreshing, and consistently light? You might just find that the road to success can be pretty enjoyable. Michelob Ultra, the perfect balance of taste and refreshment and only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. Enjoy responsibly. Anheuser-Busch Michelob Ultra Light Beer, St. Louis, Missouri. Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate at the Culver House College Business at the University of Alabama. Not a lot of time to wrap the show up. Thank you so much, Eunice. We had a tough conversation. She and I were both uncomfortable for parts of it, but we did it and we got it through, got through it. And I hope it's been helpful. If you feel someone else needs to hear this show, you can find it at whatsworkingcam.com, where you can forward it on to other people as well as subscribe to the podcast. I hope you will. I hope you'll leave a rating if that's what you uh, feel so inclined to do. If you want chapter one, cam at cammarston.com. Chapter one in the subject line, I'll attach it and send it back. I hope you will request it. The book should be available in my bookstore on my website in the coming few weeks. If you want to hear the show again, go to whatsworkingcam.com. That'll wrap us up. Thanks to John Thompson for the production of the show. You're listening to What's Working, Alabama Center for Real Estate, Culver House College Business, University of Alabama. Another show next week. Mm